Well, let me start by asking you a question. When Jesus was on earth, I had to ask my kids this question, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll ask you this question. When Jesus was on earth, what was he like? Was he big or small? In contrast, what were his early followers like? Were they big or small? What about us? What are we like? Are we more like Jesus or more like his disciples? Well, we're in the last stretch of 1 Peter. It is a letter written to Christians who are suffering. They're suffering because they are seeking to follow Jesus in the path of obedience. It's a hard road. It's a humbling road. It's a humiliating road. They were avoided, ignored, shunned, they were made to feel embarrassed. They were falsely accused. They were called names. They lost their good standing in the community. They were bullied and made to feel scared. They were even manhandled. Sound familiar? When we suffer for following Jesus in the path of obedience, it's going to be really tempting to run away and hide from the world, isn't it? Really tempting to water down what the Bible teaches. Really tempting to fight back with our words and our actions and even fight each other as well, all in an attempt to kind of vindicate ourselves before other people. When we run away and hide or we water down the doc doctrine or we fight back to try and vindicate ourselves before others, we tend to give our flesh an opportunity to wreak havoc in our lives. We also leave ourselves open to the real enemy. Not us or others, it's Satan. And worst of all, we're not able to honour God before a watching world who desperately need to hear the gospel and be reconciled back to God. And so in times like this, it is really, really crucial, it's more crucial than ever that we listen in and act on what the Apostle says about the way that Christ's shepherds are to relate to one another and with Christ's sheep. What the vital ingredient is needed from all parties for that relationship to work out and why it is crucial to keep that relationship working out and what to expect in the end because it's coming. So a word to the leaders of the church. This is what the Apostle is saying. And he wants you to know that together you are partners in the gospel. Together you are partners in the gospel. Let's begin at verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Fellow means... They are partners. That's what fellow means. They are partners. Partners together alongside other elders. Partners together with Jesus under Jesus. Jesus is the shepherd and overseer. 
chapter 2, verse 25 says, You and I were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus is the shepherd and overseer. But he's not just the shepherd and overseer. He's the chief shepherd. So Jesus is the chief shepherd. Chapter 5, verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading glory. Jesus is the chief shepherd, overseer, elder. The church leaders together are shepherds, overseers, elders, alongside one another with Jesus, but under Jesus, the chief, the boss. As partners, the leaders are expected to work together. They are not each a lone ranger. They work alongside each other, not under each other. Work together in the cause of the gospel. There's no such thing as archbishops or most reverends or seniors. No, they are partners alongside each other under the direct supervision of Jesus, under his direct oversight. They do it as they exercise oversight over his sheep. They are not only partners together alongside one another under Jesus, they are also proclaimers, proclaimers of the gospel. So again, verse 1, have a look. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. By saying that he is a witness of the sufferings of Christ, Peter does not mean that he saw Jesus die on the cross with his own eyes. He did, but that is not what he means here. He means that he and the elders, his partners, are proclaimers of the good news. They are proclaimers of the good news that Jesus died to bring believing sinners back to God. Elders are proclaimers of the good news that Jesus died to bring believing sinners back to God. So elders must never think that the gospel is only meant for unbelievers. Some think that the gospel is only meant for unbelievers. The gospel is, the, is only for unbelievers. It's certainly for them. That's for sure. They can't be rescued from the wrath of God and the eternal punishment they deserve for their rebellion without it. They can't be forgiven and brought back into a relationship without, with God without the gospel. But it is not only for them. It is for believers as well. Believers need the gospel just as much as unbelievers. The gospel is not the thing that tips us into the kingdom and then it does nothing else. It's not like we get into the kingdom and then we move on from the gospel to supposedly better things. No, we, ne we never move on from the gospel. We never move on from the gospel. We always need to proclaim the gospel because God's gospel changes God's people and it continues to change them. The gospel of the kingdom changes the people of that kingdom to live as citizens of that kingdom, the good life of that kingdom, in whatever host country God has placed us in the world. So elders are partners together with Jesus, under Jesus, partners in the gospel, they are proclaimers of the gospel to both believers and unbelievers. They are partakers. They are partakers of the gospel. They are partakers of the glory of the gospel. So again, verse 1, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. The, the glory they partake in or share of together with the rest of us 
is yet to be seen and experienced. We haven't arrived yet. It is the glory of resurrected bodies like the body Jesus has right now in glory. It is fit for a glorious new heavens and new earth with our glorious Jesus. Now we see glimpses of this future glory in the biographical accounts of Jesus. Glimpses of the sick being made well. Glimpses of the demon oppressed free. Glimpses of lepers being made clean. Glimpses of the lame walking. Withered hands being restored. Storms being stilled. Hemorrhages stopping. The dead becoming alive. The deaf hearing. The blind seeing. We see glimpses of the glory of, of the new heavens and the new earth and the resurrected body of Jesus. We see glimpses of the newness of things in the biographical accounts of Jesus. But there's more. No more being avoided or ignored and shunned. No more being made to feel embarrassed. No more being accused falsely. No more being called names. No more losing your good standing in the community. No more being bullied and made to feel scared. And no more being manhandled. Elders, you need to hear this. Take it to heart. Look forward to glorying with Jesus. Because you guys are usually the first targets to be treated badly by other leaders or congregants from inside and outside the church. Listen, it will only be for a little while and then no more. One day it will be nothing but glorying with Jesus. Try to imagine glorying with Jesus where there is no such thing as suffering or sin. No more disease, no more natural disasters, no more death, no more defamation of your character, no more deliberate attempts to destroy your work for Jesus. Elders, it's hard to imagine. Probably why the Bible uses shining jewels and lots of stunning pictures to describe glory. Because no ordinary words fail us. Listen, elders, you are partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed. Not just elders, but all who long for the appearing of Jesus, for the rest of us. But elders, let this encourage you, especially when the going gets tough. Elders are partners in the gospel alongside each other with Jesus, but under Jesus. They are proclaimers of the gospel to believers and unbelievers. They are partakers of the gospel, the glory of the gospel when Jesus comes back. And they are pastors. Pastors of churches that exist because of the gospel. Verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. So elders, overseers are shepherds. Their job is to shepherd. And the word shepherd is the same as pastor. So elders, pastors, shepherds, it, it means the same thing. All elders are pastors, shepherds. And what do shepherds generally do? Well, they shepherd the sheep. They tend to the flock that is in their care. But did you notice whose flock it is? It's the flock of God. The church is God's flock. Not the elder's flock. We don't say his church or our church or their church. Not the founding members flock, not the long-standing members flock, 
It does not belong to those who have the most money or the most influence, nor does it belong to those who have been the most generous givers. It is God's flock. You are God's flock. God owns the flock. God bought the flock. He bought it with his own blood. Peter says in chapter 1, we were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our ancestors, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. God bought the flock and he bought it with his own blood, the precious blood of Christ. It belongs to him and no one else. That does not mean that no one other than God tends to his flock. God has gifted certain people among us in the church to be its pastors. These people are God's shepherds, his shepherds. The church is not their boss. God is. God's appointed elders under the elder Jesus are commanded to pastor, to shepherd the flock of God. They are to shepherd God's flock under the chief shepherd. The government of the church is a top-down role, but it is not an autocracy with elders on top holding all the cards. And it is not a democracy with the congregation holding all the cards as well. The chief shepherd is the only one who holds all the cards. He is on top and no one else. Elders are under shepherds, under Jesus, the shepherd, the chief shepherd. And God's sheep are under their care. So Jesus, the chief shepherd, then the elders, the under shepherds, then God's sheep. We call this a theocracy. It's not an autocracy with the elders on top. It's not a democracy where the power resides in the congregation alone. It's a theocracy. Jesus, the elders, the sheep. Verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. So the way the leaders are to shepherd God's flock is by watching over the sheep of the chief shepherd. Under shepherds watch over God's sheep by feeding them from God's word. That's what I'm doing this morning. That's what other pastors and elders do. They feed from God's word. They lead the sheep, God's sheep, in God's ways. They lead. They search for when the sheep go astray. They search for them. And they protect them from the terror and tyranny of Satan and from the error and trickery of false teachers. That is their role. They feed. They lead. They search. And they protect us. And here is how they are to go about doing these things. Not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to God's flock. Not three contrasts. Not this, but this. Not this, but this. Not this, but this. Not under compulsion, not because they are forced to, but willingly, because they want to, because they love you. And that's what God wants from them. God wants them to want to. They love you. They don't do it for shameful gain, not because of the pay, not because of the fame. And the prestige. Don't put your elders on a pedestal, guys. Pray for them. They're not here for shameful gain. They're here for you. 
They are to do this eagerly. They are eagerly wanting to serve Christ. They are eager to serve you, not for personal gain, but for your gain, for your benefit. Not domineering over those in their charge, not lording, lording it over you like the Gentiles do. They are not here to build an empire. They are here to build up the Lord's people. They are here to build up the Lord's people. So they need to serve in such an exemplary way that the Lord's people can actually follow them. So a word, elders, take Peter, a fellow elder, as an example of how to be an example to Christ's sheep. For instance, whenever he tells the sheep what to do and how to do it, he always uses some facet of the gospel to move people's wills in the right direction so that their conduct is in line with the gospel of God. And he does not just talk the talk, he practices what he preaches. So elders have their work cut out for them. It's often a very difficult job and it is often a very dangerous job but it is a very well rewarding job. Verse 4. Have a look with me. It's a rewarding job, elders. Keep your eyes on the prize. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You'll receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, Christ's sheep, we are commanded to submit, submit to Christ's under shepherds. Isn't that what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 says? You don't have to look, look it up, but if, you've, if you can get there really quickly, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? For they are keeping watch over your souls. That's why they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account they will have to give an account to God for it. Let them do this with joy. Let's not make it hard for them. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Ah. Oh. Why? For that would be of no advantage to them. No. That would be no advantage to you. To you. They are not doing it for themselves. They are doing it for you, for your benefit. So let us submit to our leaders. And young people, this applies to you as well. What does 1 Peter 5 verse 5 say? Have a look. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject. That is, come under the authority of the elders. Submit to them. Now listen up, this is super important. This is really, really, really important for this relationship between the elders themselves to work out, there needs to be humility. And for the relationship between the elders and the church to work out, there needs to be humility. And for your relationships with one another to work out, there needs to be humility. Becoming small, small. Under shepherds, there must never be a time when their feet get too big for their boots. And Christ's sheep need to submit because the elders do really have your best interests at heart. We all need humility. We all need to become small. Humility is vital for our relationships to work out. It's vital. 
Let's pick it up from verse 5. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Why? For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The humility Peter is talking about is the, the humility of Jesus, isn't he? That's the mindset Jesus had. Jesus made himself nothing. He became small. He became nothing. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by being obedient, even to the point of dying on the cross. In the gospel, we see God stooping down to us. And we might expect him to stop as soon as he gets to our human level, but he doesn't. He keeps going down. He stoops down to serve us, even to the point of giving up his own lifeblood for us. And he does that so that we could be brought back to God. That is humility. If under shepherds are going to work well with one another under Jesus, if the church is going to submit to them, we all need humility. The Bible commands us all to clothe ourselves with it. Put it on. We are to put on Christ-like humility as if we were putting on clothes. Make ourselves nothing and being willing to serve. We take off pride like taking off old dirty clothes guess what those those clothes don't fit us anymore throw those away they don't fit you they don't fit the lord's people and put on being nothing now why is it crucial for that kind of relationship to keep on working why well, verse 5, because God opposes the proud. God stands opposed to the proud. He hates pride. He will not tolerate it. That's not the kind of God that he is. But in contrast, God gives grace. He shows favor. He pours out his benefits on the humble, those who put on Christ like humility. Therefore, verse 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. At the proper time he may exalt you. God's time. God may exalt us. The road marked with Christian suffering or humiliation is the same road that leads to glory. Jesus said, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The mighty hand of God not only places us in situations where we experience all the various trials along the way, it's also his powerful hand that will exalt us when we are low. In hard times, we can easily think God doesn't care about us. We can forget to throw all our worries on him in hard times. But Peter reminds us that, that God does care for us. So we can cast our cares on him. Verse 7, casting all your anxieties on him, throwing off all your worries onto God. God puts us through hard times so that we might learn to rely on him. He wants us to rely on him. He doesn't want us to rely on ourselves. He doesn't want us saying, I can do this. I can fix that. I will change this. I, 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 I. Trusting in ourselves. It's prideful. It shows a lack of trust in God. And we know that faith is precious to God. And it needs to be tested in the fiery furnace of suffering so that it can become strong. Maybe you're thinking, I'd like to depend on God, but I don't feel like God is close to me. I feel like he's far away. I, I feel like he's sitting on his hands and he, he doesn't want to help me. 
Can he see what's going on down here? Or maybe you're sitting here thinking, it's not that God doesn't want to help me, I just don't think he can help me. His hands are tied behind his back. He can see what's going on down here, but he just can't do anything about it. Listen, God's hands are never tied behind his back. It's not like he wants to help you, but he can't. And he's not sitting on his hands because he doesn't want to help you. Both of these pictures are distorted pictures of God. You can throw all your worries and all your anxieties upon him. You must throw all your anxieties and your cares on God. Why? Verse 7 tells us because he cares for you. He cares for you. That's why. God cares about you. He's your creator. He made you. His hands are not tied behind his back. Your powerful creator is your faithful creator as well. He will never stop being faithful to you. He will always care about you. He will always look after you. You can always depend on him. Someone once very wise said to me, when you can't trace God's hand, trust his heart. When you can't trace God's hand, trust his heart. I pass on this wise saying to you, brothers and sisters, when you can't trace God's hand, trust his heart. Trust his heart. He cares for you. Why is it crucial to keep on working out humble relationships with one another? Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And because Satan is on the prowl. Satan is on the prowl. Verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The devil is real and we must be ready for his attacks. Yes, Jesus has confronted him and defeated him. The one who is in us is greater than the one who prowls against us. The devil is a real enemy, but he's a defeated enemy. He's a real threat, but a limited threat. The lion is on the chain and he can only do what God permits him to do. And God has given us the grace to resist him. How do we resist him? Well, we resist him by trusting in God and in the gospel. By trusting in God and the gospel. Verse 9, resist him, firm in your faith. That is, putting your hope in God, trusting in the gospel. We resist his lies because the devil is going to try to tempt you to think that God doesn't care for you. But that's a lie. God does care for you. The gospel thunderclaps loudly and clearly. God cares for you. The line of Judah roars louder than the roar of the devil. You are never alone, brothers and sisters. When we suffer for Jesus, the devil will try to make us think that we are alone, but we are not alone. We are not alone. He will try to make us think that nobody else is going through the same things that we're going through. But that's a lie. Resist him firm in your faith, in the faith of the gospel, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You're not alone. There's something strangely comforting about knowing that we stand together side by side like comrades going to war we look over at each other eh, yeah eh, yeah 
I'm not alone. I'm with my brothers. I'm with my sisters. We're not alone. We have each other. And even though we suffer, and even though it feels like forever, the truth is, is that it's only really for a little while and then no more. When Jesus is revealed, God is going to put everything right. So here's the finale, the fireworks finale to this letter. God will right all wrongs. God will right all wrongs. Ready for the fireworks? Verses 10 and 11. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you, saved you, to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself confirm, strengthen, and establish you. These are the fireworks going off, guys. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let me wrap it all up. And before we, we close... I want you to know you are God's loved children, your refugees on your way home to be with Jesus, Christ's shepherd and sheep, elders, shepherds under the elder, overseer, chief shepherd. You are partners together in the gospel, proclaimers of the gospel, partakers of the glory that is coming because of the gospel and pastors over the sheep that came into existence through the gospel. Watch over God's flock under your care the flock God bought with his own blood, the precious blood of Christ. Do it because you want to. Do it for the benefit of God's flock. Lead them by example. God's flock, submit to your leaders as as they submit to the chief. Let us all keep our relationships going by taking off our pride and putting on Christ-like humility, becoming nothing and willing to do anything for each other. Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And because Satan is on the prowl, we are not alone. God cares for us. And we are in the same boat as our brothers and sisters all over the world. Come what may, in the end, God will make all things right again when Jesus is revealed. Amen.